Okay. <clears throat> uh, since uh, this isn't a replacement course like this morning, I don't have to spend half of my time making sure that everybody's in the right spot. <clears throat> it doesn't say it anywhere, but this is PowerShell beginning with a focus on databases, but really anything we do here can be applied just about anywhere. Um, we'll get into more of that later, but this is a 100% bottom of the barrel. I've heard the word PowerShell, or maybe not, and want to know what it's all about. Are you cool with that? Excellent. Then you're in the right spot. Now, I'm glad to see there are some girls here because I find girls are a lot better coders than guys. Just kidding, guys. We're better. Okay, so what is PowerShell and what is it all about? Well, oh, and I've also got some slightly off-color PowerShell jokes that I'll sprinkle throughout the thing, too. So, um, <clears throat> Okay, so PowerShell is Microsoft's new... Okay, for lack of a better term, we'll call it their new scripting language. Oh, good, another girl. We like those. Um, it's the repl I want to say it's the replacement for, BB for VB script, and it really kind of is, except it goes a lot further. Anybody in here is involved with Linux, and you'll know that Linux has a pretty rich interactive scripting environment uh, that they've held over us for years and years and years because we didn't have anything like it. Um, and now we've upped them one step more. So uh, PowerShell is actually better than what is it in, in Linux, like the grep? Is that what it's called? I, I, I know a Linux head who's told me a dozen times and I never can remember it because um, I don't care. Uh, but anyway, so <coughs> I figure the, I usually find the best way to show you what PowerShell is all about is to compare it directly to VB script first off and foremost. So you can see kind of where we were and why we're doing what we're doing now, right, and what it's actually going to do for you. My main goal here is to teach you a little bit of PowerShell, enough so you can get by and know what the structure is like and all that, but my biggest goal is to get you excited about PowerShell and to make you really understand why you want to, and make you want to go out and say, yes, I have to learn this, and, and just to get excited about it, right? So I'm going to stand up through the rest of this course and take my shirt off, and that ought to go with the exciting part, at least for the guys. Uh, well, at least with Ryan. Oh, and by the way, we all owe Ryan a huge amount of thanks. It's, he is directly responsible for this happening because I didn't think I spoke again until 2. And I was just standing around, and he said, dude, you're on in like 10 minutes. I'm like, uh, real? oh, my God, it's 10 minutes. So he's responsible for me being here today, at least right now. He's my, uh, he's my conference wife. He makes sure I need to be where I need to be. Yeah, I know, right? So, okay, let's look at a couple uh, VBScript versus PowerShell examples. How many of us are really big VBScript guys other than Ryan? Because I know he's like the VBScript guy, right? Nobody, nobody VBScript in here? Well, a Fine, bit. a little Ryan bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah, you don't do it for fun, right? Yeah. So, <coughs> so, okay, let's take a look at, say, what it would be to, uh, I like this one the best. Um, no, we'll, yeah, we'll do that. Create a file in VBScript. That's quite common. You, you take something, you spit it out to a text file to do something with or to give to somebody, right? That's fairly common. And this is, I'll open it with Notepad. This is a very common VB script, right? So all I'm doing, oh, and this one, I'm not even spitting anything out. I'm just writing a direct string. I don't know why I chose Book Another Holiday. Every time I teach this class, I go, why did I choose that again? So it's a reminder for yourself that if you're ever searching your hard drive that you should book another holiday for something. I need to change that. It beats Hello World. That's what I was doing. I was trying to get as far away from Hello World as I could. So all it does is it takes this text and puts it into a text file named myvbfile.txt, right? So you've got to create your object, you've got to set all your options, then you've got to open the thing, then you've got to write line to the string text, and then you've got to close it. So this is actually pretty much, I mean, Ryan, you're a lot better with VBScript than I am because I haven't done it in like almost five years now. That's pretty standard file write kind of stuff for VBScript, right? Maybe you could get it down by a couple lines by combining a couple things, but for the most part, this is what we'll call as our minimum for writing to a, a file, right? For the most part. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly, right? So that same thing in, uh, in PowerShell, and this one has write processes to file. Um, da -da -da -da. Doesn't look like I have a PowerShell example, um, but I will use the write processes example because it is practically the same thing. 
So this is how to write processes. Now I'll, I'll duplicate that. There you go. That's the exact example right there. So that's how, that's how you would write text to a file in PowerShell. Gazillions of times easier. Oh, and even I, a SQL DBA admin, uh, made modifications on the fly. Wow, imagine that. So that's how much easier it can be. Now you remember that, I won't save that. There we go. Now let's list all the processes from, open with, VB script. Oops, that's the PowerShell example, get process. Here's the VB script. See, I have to actually go to the one that says .vbs to get this one. So list all processes. And this is a WMI call, right? So this is how you would list all the processes to the screen if you wanted to just see what was running on your computer, right? It's the, the equivalent of task manager, right? So you notice how you have to circle, you have to cycle through WMI service and you have, but the problem is, is there's no way to get clean output with VB script. So it's just going to spit it out any way it can. You got to go, uh, or you got to try to find a way to write it, do a, a right line to each file that we did before, right? And then it's still not going to be beautifully formatted. It's, it's, it's horrendous to try to do, get stuff like that in VB script. And you can't change things on the fly and all of that. So you've got a pretty much very rigid script. And you saw what the VB script version, I mean, what the PowerShell version was. It was just get process, right? A single command. And uh, to format it in different ways is just about that much longer, right? It's very, very simple. Um, I believe I had one more. Oh, yeah, the processes. So if you find a process that you want to stop, like if you want to stop all the notepads or if you want to stop all the SQL services or whatnot, in VB script, it's a little bit shorter, but you're still cycling through the WMI object, the, the Win32 process object, and you're creating an object and you're calling the terminate method, but it's still a few lines of code. What's that, like 10 lines of code, give or take, right? If you want to do the same thing in PowerShell, it's one line of code, and that's even like a quarter of a line of code, right? So it's very, very simple. And this is one of the, this is the reason why PowerShell is such a big deal, because it takes things that are half a page and two pages long and turns them into just a couple lines or even a single line. The, the number of things that I do, okay, I wasn't much of a scripter. I'm still not much of a scripter. I never have been, okay? I'm an admin, all right? Um, and when we had to do everything in VB script, it was absolutely horrendous because I was never good enough to just go write VB script from scratch because create an object and then call the object, instantiate the object, cycle through the object, all that stuff. I, I, I never could think like that. It didn't, really, it didn't really ring well with me. So I always had to steal code off the internet and then try to alter it as best I can to make it do what I wanted to do, right? I mean, that's how everybody does, right? Um, that's how everybody does it. Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly, right? Nobody writes VB script except maybe this guy here. But, um, but I never could, and, and even altering it is really hard. And when you're working with WMI, that's why a lot of people haven't even heard of WMI, because the only way to work with it for years was through VB script, and who's going to go through that crap, right? But now WMI is coming back into the forefront because you can, you know, call, you know, two inches worth of code, and you're done, right? So that's why PowerShell is such a big deal, because it, it takes things like that and makes it available to people like me. Who, can't, who don't really have scripting minds, right? So that's why I get excited about it. That's why you should get excited about it. And when we get to that section, I will point out the thing that did it for me because there's something in PowerShell that is so cool that is, that is when I finally got it, when the light finally came on for me, when somebody showed me this, I went, okay, that's what I'm talking about right there. And I'll point that out when I get to that point here in a couple minutes. So... PowerShell is written in .NET. It is based on .NET. And if you are a .NET guy, then you, especially C Sharp, you will gravitate towards PowerShell and you will go a lot further than, than us, we mere mortal admins can do, right? Um, I have taught this for C Sharp guys and some pretty good C Sharp guys who wanted to know what PowerShell was all about. And I'm explaining things, how they work and everything. Like, oh yeah, that's just a delegate because the thing, the thing, watch, I bet you can do this. And they bang it out. See, look, that works. And I bet you can do that. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> well, you know, they're C Sharp guys. I mean, they really know this stuff, right? But once you understand that it's just .NET based, 
you know, everything else is wide open. And you've got a lot of, nat quote, native PowerShell ways to do things. But you can also call the, dot, the, the base .NET classes and do it the way you want to as well. And uh, one of the other really cool things about PowerShell is it's, it's completely integrated with DOS. So even from, a even from the PowerShell window, you don't have to know PowerShell to run PowerShell, okay, to use PowerShell. If there is a command that you're used to running in DOS, it works from PowerShell. And then you can just make it interactive with PowerShell variables and whatnot. So you don't have to learn the, quote, proper way to do things in PowerShell. You can do it the way you're used to doing it and just throw in the PowerShell and use PowerShell as like a conduit to doing what you're already used to doing. And I'll show you some of that as we go through here, and you'll just be like, wow, that's amazing. And it, it, it dawns on me that I never actually told you guys who I am and what I'm all about. And I just saw my PowerShell thing. That so I don't. I'm not really big on slides. I don't do slides at all. But I have my vanity slide here that I'll go ahead and show you guys real quick. So I'm Sean McCown. I'm a SQL Server MVP. This is, uh, like I said, a beginning PowerShell course. But I am going to concentrate more on the database side. But it doesn't matter. Okay. Um, I'm a contributing editor with Info World Magazine. You can see all of my free SQL training videos and lots of PowerShell stuff, lots of it, on MidnightDBA.com. Uh, everything on there is free. You can download it, distribute it, do whatever you want to it. Just don't take my name off of it. And uh, everything is golden. And I've got dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of free videos on there from all aspects of SQL and PowerShell. So go there and knock yourself out. Have a weekly web show called DBAs at Midnight. It's, I would say it's mainly a database show, but we cover a lot of IT topics. And it's on, yeah, we do, don't we? Yeah, he's there. Um, and it's uh, every Friday night at 11 o'clock Central is when the show starts. We have a pre-show that's a little bit more liberal as far as topics and, and language and all of that. It's got a, full, it's got a chat room, so a lot of... Uh, Anything goes in the pre and the post shows, and they're, the pre and post shows are fun, aren't they? I mean, I mean, we get in, we talk about everything from sex to racism to, I mean, a, a, everything. I mean, these guys, get, DBAs are filthy, right? They're like, you know, sailors. Sailors are light DBAs, right? And they're, so we get on there and just talk about just whatever crosses our minds. Um, one, just watch the commercials. Yeah, yeah. A couple, a couple weeks ago, we got off on a topic of song titles that had fluffer in the title. So we would replace, we would replace the key words in the song titles with fluffer, and it was just, and we went on for like two hours after the show like that. I mean, it was ridiculous. We, finally, about two o'clock, we said, "Guys, we got to go to bed. We're falling asleep here." But it was still going and going and going and going. So I mean, just it's all wide open. So shows tonight. Pre-show starts at 10.30. The regular show starts at 11. Come check us out. You'll have a good time. Uh, the website, Midnight DBA, has all the info on the show. Um, okay, so that's it for the vanity slide. Now, let's get into... Let's get in. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. That's right. And come to NTSUG. It's the North Texas SQL Server User Group. Hey, I got that right, and I'm even on the board. Um, uh, third Thursday of every month, we meet at Microsoft in Irving. Is that right? And... Uh, and I speak there all the time, so but don't let that deter you from coming. Um, all right, can I get back to PowerShell now? Yes. Okay, good. Geez, you are my conference wife. Okay, okay. Written in .NET. Let me see. Oh yeah, the thing that's that's really cool about PowerShell is that it, I hate to say it's a standard, but it really is. The more you learn about PowerShell, the more you the more you can apply it to other things. The things I do at the file system in PowerShell are the exact same things that I do, syntax and everything, in SQL. They're the exact same things I do in Hyper-V, or in Exchange, or in IIS, or in whatever, or SCOM these days, right? Uh, everything that you can do in PowerShell, you can do, it doesn't change from one program to another, from one aspect to another. They've really done an excellent job of standardizing how everything works. So if you can do something in exchange, you can take that exact same thing syntax-wise, right, and do it in IIS or do it in SQL Server. Or if Oracle had a PowerShell provider, you could do it in Oracle. Um, but 
and, and a lot of third parties are starting to write PowerShell providers. Uh, I've got a, I'm in healthcare, and I've got my main healthcare application. The vendor just wrote their first PowerShell provider, their first PowerShell commandlet, and I was like, wow, that's excellent. So even even individual vendors are writing PowerShell commandlets for their applications, and it's and it's a beautiful thing. So once you learn. Just because I'm showing you in SQL doesn't mean that you're not going to go and be able to apply it to all different kinds of things. Because the language is the language and it doesn't matter what you apply it to. That's something that's really cool, right? Um, let's see, what else have I forgotten? Uh, okay, objects versus text. This is one of those architectural things that you have to understand. And I'll hit it harder when we get into, into the pipeline here in a couple minutes. But Everything in PowerShell, while it's in the pipeline, is the object itself. This is where we differ from the Linux tool, which is, and from VBScript, where when you pull something back, say from WMI, like if you pull back a list of services, you open the object, you query the object, and then it just pulls back a text representation of that object and shows it to you, right? But while it's in the PowerShell pipeline, it is that object. So if you accidentally call a kill method, you've killed the object, period. It is that object. There is no open this up for reading and then open up another object for writing and open up and then call a method. No. Once you have that object, that is the object. End of discussion. You are working with the object itself. Really important for you to understand. <laughs> okay. um, now, by the time it hits the screen, it's left the pipeline and it spit it out to the screen, right? But as you'll see, while it's in the pipeline, and we'll see a couple examples of this, you will be doing the object itself. And it's really easy to mess up everything on your box. It's a lot easier. Th this is one thing that's really cool. It's easier to do things on multiple objects than it is on a single object. That's what PowerShell is for, is it scales so well. I can do something on one server, whether it be an exchange or or IIS or SQL or the file system or whatever. And to expand that same thing to 200 servers is about an extra line of code. That's how easy PowerShell is. That's why it's called PowerShell and not wussy shell, right? <laughs> so it's incredibly powerful and that's why it's such a big deal to everybody, okay? Uh, da -da 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 object stuff. Okay, so let's go ahead and start working with a little bit of this. now. Commandlets. I'll go ahead and open up PowerShell. I'm on Windows 7, so I got it down here. Is I've there got. An install for that? I'm sorry. Is there an install? Yes. Can y'all see that? Okay. Okay. Good. Because these are my. I mean, being a DBA, I, I do everything at night, so I've got my nice not don't blind me nighttime colors, right? So yeah. So PowerShell. If you go to Microsoft.com/slash/PowerShell, you'll see the installs there. It's about two and a half megs. Doesn't require a reboot. So you can put it on your busiest server and not even skip a beat. And, it's, and it, it installs, boom, just like that. Right? So it's very simple, very fast. you got to pick the version for uh, server 08 and Windows 7 and above. It comes installed with the OS. So no problems there. Uh, and I think the lowest version you can put it on is uh, server 03 at some service pack level. But... I forget that, but they've got the they've got all the versions listed there that you can that you can download for, so it's all good, right? Okay, uh, da -da -da -da. okay. So let's go ahead and look at, at one of the things that people want to see the most. Let's look at services, right? Um, that's one of the big things you that admins do is they look at the services running on their box. Boom. Okay, so I got a list of services, right? This get service right here is what's called a commandlet. Why they call it commandlets, I have yet to ask. I guess I should ask Jeffrey Snover about that. But um, basically what it boils down to is a DOS command. How many of us are actually database people in the room? Anybody other than me and these two guys? Okay, good. So it would be the, it's equivalent to a store procedure. It's got a bunch of .NET code that it runs in the background uh, or a function for those of you who are other types of coders, right? Um, uh, or a subroutine, depending on, on your background, right? So you call, one simple, you call one simple little command, you can pass it parameters, and it goes off and does whatever it's going to do in the background. Fair enough? Okay. And you can write your own. If you've got some specialized things that you want to do, you can write your own commandlets and, and install them on your box and be just fine. So 
That's the, that's the basics of writing a commandlet, I mean, of calling a command to get all the services. It's that simple. I can get the status, I can get the name, I can get the display name. Now, I'm always at a crossroads here about whether, when I should introduce filtering and when I should introduce the pipeline and all that stuff. But let's go ahead and introduce the pipeline and a simple filter, okay? Now, we, we've got the concept of aliases, which is simply you can have a, a shortened version that you give it a, a little nickname, and then it, it goes ahead and maps it to the, to the real commandlet name, right? Everybody knows, everybody can, can even guess what the concept of an alias is, right? So I'm gonna, the way I usually do this is I'll type the full commandlet name once, and then I'll use the alias because you'll see, okay? So let's say, and you've got full, you've got the full tab, you can tab through things and up and down arrows just like you can in DOS and get your previous commands. Um, so let's say I wanna limit this so I'm going to pipe this. That's putting it in the pipeline. You look at the pipe symbol. The way I like to visualize it is, it, visualize it is uh, like it's a relay race. And the pipe symbol is a baton. I'm going to take the results from get service, and I'm going to hand them off to the next commandlet, and it's going to do something with them, who's then going to hand them off to the next commandlet and do something with them, right? So it's very simple. So I'm going to get service, and let's say I want to get all the SQL services right? Everything that has SQL in it. So I'm going to say, I'm going to hand that off to the where object. That has to go in curly brackets. And I'll explain the syntax in a minute. Uh, da -da 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 -da. What do I want to say? Where display name match SQL. There. So now I've only got the, the ones that have SQL on them. So I'm going to explain this syntax because it's, it's not entirely intuitive until you learn how to read it and then, you go, and then it's really intuitive, right? Um, okay, so I'll go ahead and print this again down here. Okay, so put it up a little bit higher. Get service, take all the services that you get back from that and pass them off to the where object. The where object in its curly brackets says take for each one, we all know how to loop right? In any given programming language, there's like a while loop where you, you circle, you cycle through everything that comes along, right? Uh, and in SQL, we have, the, we have the current iteration cursor, right, that tells you this is the current one in the loop. Well, that's what this does. The, the dollar sign underscore is the built-in variable for the current iteration. So I've, say, got 60 services coming back from here, right? So for each one of these, I want to make sure the display name has the word SQL in it. Does that make sense? Any questions? Because I can, I can explain it elsewise. I want, people, I want you guys to actually understand this. Okay, I'm going to go on then. So for the current iteration dot display name, match is a, a regular expression operator. So what that says is if SQL appears anywhere in there, then uh, go ahead and give it to me. If I wanted it to be like where it, where it begins, I would say like that, right? If I wanted it to end with SQL, right? I would do it like that, right? If I wanted it to equal SQL, Right? Stuff like that. So equals, not equals, greater than, less than, you get the idea, right? Um, that'll take you a while to memorize, and you'll always do the greater than or less than signs um, several times until you get used to, oh, that's right, it has to be dash EQ, or you'll always put an equal sign in there or a double equal sign, and you'll get a syntax error, and you'll go, what the hell is wrong with this? Okay, it's equals. What the hell? It's double equals. What the? Why won't PowerShell? And then you'll go to some site and it's a dash EQ. Oh, that's right. Ugh. That was probably the hardest part for me was making the transition from an equal sign to a dash EQ. And I still mess it up sometimes. Yes? Uh -huh. You can do anything in regular expressions here that you can in normal regular expressions. So yeah, when you use the match, then you can just use regular expressions inside that double quotes and you are golden.
and you can get very rich. You can say anything that starts with an A, has three more letters, and then has SQL or something like that. I mean, as rich as regular expressions can get, you can get in your searches here, and it's terribly powerful. I love it. Um, so now I'll, okay, so we got, I did, oh, that's right, because I didn't do, oh, yeah, see? I left my operator off of there. There we go. CLS to clear the screen. There we go. Okay, so if I were to write this again, say for production, I'm going to use the alias. Ah, that's much better. I just brought my code all the way down, right? And the same thing, right? So instead of using the full, and you could use where instead of where object, but it all maps back to where dash object. So commandlets, without exception, and I have been doing PowerShell for five years or so now, and I have never seen an exception. They are always verb dash noun. Get something, put something, uh, see something, do something, right? So shove something, you know. So it's always verb dash noun. Always, without exception. Okay? So there is a very good standardization there. Okay? Um, <clears throat> I have heard rumors that one of the other groups, uh, like maybe the office group or somebody, has started writing some commandlets that didn't fit that format, and people are uprising against it. I mean, they're just mad. No, it's PowerShell, verb, dash, noun, right? I mean, they're really upset, and rightfully so, because there are some things you should be able to count on. Okay. Um, okay. <clears throat> Okay, so we explained that everything in the pipeline is an object, right? So now would be the time for one of those slightly off-color jokes that I told you about. <clears throat> How is PowerShell better than your wife? The PowerShell won't laugh if your object is too small. Right? Okay. I've got some for the women, too, by the way. It's not, it's not all just, it, it's all sexist, but I have them for both sides. Um, Okay, here's one. How is PowerShell better than your husband? PowerShell won't give you a 3K object and try to convince you it's 10K. Huh? Okay, good. So I like to even it out, right? Okay. <clears throat> we'll sprinkle some more of those as we go on. I wrote those, by the way. All right, let's see where we are. Oh, yes. We are down to PS Drive. This is the thing that got me excited about PowerShell. I didn't get it, I'll be honest. I thought it was just one, uh, a new script. Great, another scripting language. And don't let the real PowerShell MVPs know that I called it a scripting language because officially it's not. It's more like a scripting environment. They get really picky about that distinction, but as far as we're concerned, it's a scripting language. So, you know, just, just don't tell guys like, you know, Jeffrey Hicks and and Snover and those guys, that Don Jones, that, that I'm calling it a scripting language. But anyway, so PS Drive. Everything in PowerShell is exposed to you as a hard drive, right? And I can see that through PS Drive. So let's take a look at what we've got here. And this is really, this is such an interesting concept because you already know how to work with PowerShell if you can do this, right? Okay, so I've got C colon. I've got aliases. Uh, so you can see all the aliases. You can just go and explore the aliases, right? And we'll explore some of these. I've got some uh, environment stuff. I've got all the functions, both the built-in and the ones for my session. Yes? So did you have gear aliases? I'm sorry? D-I-R aliases? We're getting there. Okay. Don't get ahead of the story. Yes. And they've even got some built-in Linux kits, so you can even ls aliases for the Linux guys who want to come in and go, ah, but I'm used to ls. You go ls, right? Okay, so, but look at this. We got some registry, registry hard drive, SQL server hard drive. What the hell does that even mean, right? Let's see, how do you connect to, let's say we're in DOS. How would you connect to the root of C? Right? Right? I'm on the root of C, right? Um, let's say I want to connect to the aliases. 
I see all the aliases. Right? Let's see what else. Uh, let's go ahead and get crazy. So I'm in the registry right now. And remember what I said. What did I say? <laughs> what did I say about objects in the pipeline? They're real, right? These are live objects, right? So I can say right? And I can make changes, I can make additions, I can delete things as long as I have Windows permissions to do it. I can do anything I have permissions in Windows to do, right? Cuz it just inherits Windows. It doesn't try to rewrite the book, right? So I can do everything here that I need to in my registry, right? So, pretty powerful stuff. How does it work with the run as administrator permission? But you know, you have to like right click on some app and run as administrator? Right, so there's a couple ways you can do that. The question is, how does it work if you need to run something in admin mode, right? Yeah, it looks to me like anything in the registry, you need to run in admin mode. <laughs> well, it depends. I've got my box always set up to, uh, to automatically elevate me, right? Because um, I'm, I'm shallow and I need that kind of validation. But if you notice here, I'm running, I'm running PowerShell as an admin right here. So you can right click and say run as admin on PowerShell, but you can also pass it credentials as well. So you can also say, you can also set up a credential in PowerShell and you can say run this as an admin. So yeah, there are a couple different ways you can do that. So now let's get to what we actually came for. Let's get to some SQL stuff, right? Connect to the default instance. Uh, oh, that's right. I like that. So now I'm on SQL. There we go. So now I can see my machine name here, right? But I'm just going to connect to localhost because you guys don't want to sit here and watch me try to figure out how to type that, do you? Right? So now if I do a directory on that. I get audits and credentials and databases and job server and logins and mail and triggers and all that good stuff, right? Databases. Do a directory on that. What do I get under databases? Too much to handle, right? I mean, look at that. That's You don't mind if I stop that, do you? Okay. <clears throat> so now we're going to get into, into another command called format table. One of my favorites. Um, I can take this output and pipe it to a format table and I can get that, right? You can see over here the name of the database way over there. That's kind of crappy though, isn't it? I mean, that's, it's useful, but it's not very user friendly, is it? So let's make this a little bit more user friendly. Um, let's say, okay, so that's the name. So I can pick, ah, there we go. So I can just tell it which columns I want to pick, right? So I can say directory, get an entire directory of this subtree, pipe that to a format table object, which clearly formats it as a table, and only give me the name that was right there, right? I could have said display name too, but only give me the name, right? And if I wanted to see name and something else, I would just separate those with commas. Is everybody with me? Pretty cool. So now, Now I'm in AdventureWorks, and I, you see here I've got tables and log files and plan guides and triggers and stored procedures, right? So I can say tables, do a directory on it. Oh, well, I got the same problem, don't I? So now I just go up. There we go. Now I can get the names of the tables. See that? I just use the up. So just because I'm in a different node of the tree doesn't mean the command has to change. The command is the exact same. I did uh, directory, popped it to a format table, and said name, right? Now, let's say I want to see, let's get rid of this. Let's use the alias, FT. And let's, use, let's look at the schema, too, because that's quite often important. There we go. So now I've got the schema and the table name. And I can go back up there and see the thing, right? Now auto means auto size, 
Not imperative, but a good idea. If I take that off of there, see how much, see how, how much more real estate, it's harder to follow that across. So auto size, just make sure that they scrunch up closer together like that, right? Again, not imperative, but really handy, okay? So you can format these things as a table. You could format them as a list, but that's what we started with, right? So you could say FL instead, and we'd get that long list that we got before, right? And that's just practically useless. Um, well, it's useful for some things, but for listing tables and stuff, who wants to see that? Who wants to see, wouldn't you rather look through this than that? That tells me absolutely nothing, right? Okay, so <coughs> we'll get back to doing stuff with tables in a, in a second. As long as we're on format table, let's go ahead and take a look at get member. There are two things that you are going to do in PowerShell, and even after five years that you're going to do in PowerShell like 20 times a day. One of them is help, and the other one is get member. <coughs> you live in get member. If you remember nothing from this course except the fact that I threatened to teach it shirtless, um, remember get member. And just the same as I can pipe, uh, as I can pipe the directory to a format table or a format list or create a file or whatever, I can create it to get its members. So for those of you who aren't super .NET savvy, <clears throat> a class in .NET has different members. Those members are made up of methods and properties, right? So a method is like a function, it's a verb. Do something to something, right? That's a method. I want you to call this method that does something. So remember in the, in the, uh, the previous example where we were uh, stopping services and we called the stop method in there? I didn't highlight it, but it was in there. Um, and I'll show you another good method call here in a second. Um, uh, that was do something. Take the services that are in the pipeline and stop them. But you could easily say take the services that are in this method that are in this pipeline and, and print them out to a file, right? Or send them to FTP or do whatever you want to do, right? Um, so the same thing goes with the members. I can say take everything that's at this structure and give me all of the, all of the properties and methods that I can perform against this, right? So that's what you're trying to find out. And it will be different for everything, right? The methods, uh, the, the members that you pull back on files and folders are going to be different than methods you pull back on database tables, which are going to be different than the methods you pull back on triggers and logins and databases themselves and servers and so on and so on, right? So every type of object has a different list of methods, right? So, I mean, for instance, to say... Uh, to say that you want the length of a field coming back as, as text, right? That means something because it's text and sometimes you want to know how long it is, right? But that means absolutely nothing to dates or numbers, right? Because you don't really care how long they are. You care what their value is, right? So that's just a, a simple example that I made up off the top of my head that just means absolutely nothing. But I'll, anyway. Um, so or truncating a table. So you want to you want to truncate all the data out of a table. That means absolutely nothing to a to an array, right? You can't truncate the data out of, I mean you, you destroy the array and you rebuild it, right? But you can't actually truncate it the same way that you can a database table. So it doesn't mean anything. Uh, <clears throat> so the way you do that is dir colon get member or gm and you'll always hear PowerShell people say, well, just GM it and see, right? That's what we're going to do. We're going to GM this and see. Now, remember, I said anything marked as a method is a verb. And anything marked as a property is, is an adjective, so to speak, right? It's information you can get about that, about that object. So look at all the different things we can do here. And you want to know before how I picked the columns for the format table because I said name and schema. Even though schema wasn't in there, I knew, I've worked with enough that I know schema is there, right? Well, anything that's a property can be a format table column. So let's take a look at these tables. And this is where it gets really cool, especially for DBAs, right? I can say directory, format table. Uh, we'll just go back to name. We know we can put schema in there, right? And we'll say name and 
row count and data space used in auto, right? So there's name, there's row count, and data space used is way at the top. You can just trust me, right? So anything, I know he's like, trust you. Um, but anything that's marked as a property, you can use as a format table column. So you can get a lot of information on these databases, on these, on these tables, really, really easily, right? So, and I can sort these easily by row count or by data space used or by name or by whatever, right? And I can get them by schema. I can easily say where, so I can say, I could insert here where, don't forget your curlies. I'll go ahead and put my pipe in there. I like to set up my structure ahead of time. Dot, oh, let's see. Where it equals, what are you doing? Equal, are you kidding? Q, jeez. Person, so I'm gonna get everything from the person schema, and there you go. So, in one line, and try to do that in T-SQL easily. Seriously, I mean, it would be a cursor a page and a half long. I mean, it, it's just impossible. And then I can take that and pass it along to anything else, right? And the cool thing is, this is, this is the time to talk about uh, variables. It's a very interactive environment, so variables are extremely easy to come by. To create a variable, you don't have to dim it first. It's not, ob it's not option explicit, right? you can just create a variable and use it on the fly. Okay, so I can say, and all variables start with a dollar sign. So I can say cash A equals, right? And I've just set the variable equal to that. If I wanna print it, I just say A, and it says hello, and there you go, right? But you can set variables equal to anything, right? So I've got this directory here that I just did. Set that equal to a variable. There we go. Now I say cache A, and I get the thing, right? So now if I want to see A dot row count, uh, I gotta I gotta pipe that I go A, and then I gotta do the row count. So anyway, that's that I don't want to get I think that's the second class, so I'm getting ahead of myself. But if I say, if I do a GM on that, then I get all types of data back here because it's a multi-object, it's, a, it's, a multi, uh, uh, it's just a, a format table right there. So um, I, just did a, I just did it to a format table, so that's, I'm going to get format table kind of stuff. Um, what did I do that to? Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, back to that. Okay, good. Now. Let's see, where am I? We'll get back to the joke in a second. I'll teach one more thing first. Okay. Um, so that's how to get. That's how to do a Git member, and we've covered uh, filtering, and we've covered aliases. We never actually looked at the aliases, but you can see that, right? Um, da, 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 da. Let's go ahead and look at. Uh, okay, one more thing on format table, real quick. We might get into the advanced format table in the next course, where we can actually use expressions and 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 build expressions with different columns so we can combine things and do addition and whatnot. I don't remember if that's in the second court and the, and the one after this or not. But one thing that you should be aware of when you're doing format table um, is it doesn't tell you when you get something wrong. And I have spent so much time troubleshooting stuff that didn't exist through simple typos. So let's say I want to do a, a dir, not a fur. That would be Texas PowerShell, wouldn't it? Um, and I want to get a format table, name, comma, row count, comma, and Sean's column. 
which clearly doesn't exist, but it'll give it to you anyway. It'll just make it null. It'll just make it blank. So if you do something, and this is this is where that can kind of suck, right? Let's right. You accidentally you you left out a U or something, right? No row counts. And now you're pulling your hair out trying to figure out why this isn't working. Right. So that's one thing that I say that I'll say against PowerShell. When I get something wrong like that, you should tell me it doesn't exist. Don't just spit it out as an empty kind of thing, right? But I think that kind of stems from being able to create uh, expressions, columns as expressions, because you can label a column and create and put nothing in it if you wanted to, but that's specifically creating a, a a column as an expression. I don't think that should carry over into here, but it does. So just be aware that if you mistype something, it will not correct you. Now, getting help. Getting help in PowerShell is a blessing and a curse, right? It's really easy to to get it, but it's all just kind of text-based stuff right here, and it doesn't. It's there's no real you know, like the other BOL for Visual Studio and SQL that we get that's really nice and you can search and all that stuff. No, you're pretty much stuck with command line help, right? The good news is it's actually pretty good for command line help. So if I want to get help on something, I would say get help. Let's say I wanted to do it on the dir command, right? Just to see what's possible on dir. I always sound so stupid. I feel so stupid saying that. Dir. Um, so, uh, uh, here I've got the, it gives me the syntax, it tells me what it does, it tells me what it maps to, it maps, maps to get child item, right? Uh, another alias for that is GCI. Um, it tells you what it does, gives you the syntax, uh, gives you a description down here, related links that you can find. That's very, very limited, isn't it? I mean, it gives you a little bit, but that's not much. But that's what these flags down here are for, dash example, dash detail, dash full. So I can come down here and say, dash full, which is what I usually end up doing. And you see how I got all these examples here now of how to use it. So not only do I get full, uh, and I'm pointing at my screen again like you can see it, not only do I get a full explanation of every single one of the parameters, but also have some really nice examples here. And these examples are where it's at. I learn more about the different commandlets by going through help and just looking at the different examples, different ways that they use it than I ever learned from anything else. And you'll be in here all the time trying to figure out different ways. And it's a good idea too, right? Take something you use all the time, and especially when a new version of PowerShell comes out, we're on two now, by the way. Um, when a new version of PowerShell comes out, go through the stuff you do all the time and, and run through the, the help and see if they've added anything new to it. Because it's something that you go, wow, I never even I never even would have thought of that, right? So. Uh, and you can get just the examples, clearly, by doing examples, and then you can get just the examples, right? So lots of really clever ways to use things in there, and they all work really well. Um, so now, let's talk about calling methods. Calling methods is very easy, um, and again, it's one of those things. Let's go, let's go back to uh, get service, right? So I can get all my services. And again, I can pull a GM on that and get all the methods, right, for my services. Through get service, these are the things I can do to them. You notice I have stop and start, pause. Um, these are the properties I can get. So every one of these properties, uh, whether it be uh, status or display name or machine name. So if I'm pulling a bunch of services from 10 different boxes, I probably want to pull the machine name so I know which box is which, right? Make that a column in my result set so I can filter through and know which, which box I'm talking about here. Um, but calling a method, let's go ahead and see if you can guess what this line does. I'll tell you what, I'll clear screen to put that back at the top for you. I'm going to use a new one for you. This is going to be the for each. I'm just going to go ahead and jump straight to the command. That's a percent sign. It means for each. Don't forget your curlies. For each one of those, um, what do you think that does? For every service on the box, right? Because there's no where clause, right? So it's easier to do things against multiple objects than it is a single object. 
So if I wanted to stop all the SQL services, now let's do something real quick. Let's call that step just in case I accidentally hit enter with my, in case my, my pinky gets ahead of me, right? It won't actually stop any of my services, so I'm just going to kind of foolproof it. Because I, I don't want my box to reboot right now. Um, but let's say if I wanted to limit the, the number of these that I did, right? I would say where, don't forget your curlies. So there, I am going to stop all of the SQL services. Or in my case, I'm going to step all the SQL services. Yes. Oh, I thought I saw somebody's hand raising in the side. So that's how that would work, right? And so I'll change, I could change that back to stop. Don't forget, don't write down step. And so you said it was step. Um, and I'll get an error now if I try to do that, right? So. It's really easy to do things on, on multiple objects. Now I'll go back up here. So it'll nope. give you an error for that, for a bad method, it's just the other stuff. That yeah, it will give me a, it will, well, yeah, because it's not mapped anything. It's not doing anything, right? So once again, to call a method. Just, just yeah, well, you know. And if it takes any parameters, then they go right in there, right? So that's how you would stop every single service on the box. That's how you, uh, that's how you would uh, call a method. That's how you call a method in SQL at the file system, in Exchange, in IIS, in Hyper-V, in SCUM, in anything. It doesn't matter. This syntax stays the same. It's always going to be uh, cache underscore dot method name and then whatever parameters that method name accepts and some of them are overloaded and all of that right so let's get off of there before I do something stupid now let's do the same thing in SQL because that was at the service level right let's do the same thing at SQL um, let's pull a directory on that. I did it again so let's pull a directory on that and pull name okay so what are some of the methods that we might want to do against tables? Well, I'll tell you one of the most common things that people just don't think about being a real pain in the ass, scripting. It's really hard to script objects outside of the wizard in SQL, right? Don't forget your curlies. Now it's not. Remember, it is not called wussy shell, right? Now, what do you think it would take for me to, to uh, pipe all those out to a file? A lot more coding, I'm telling you. I'm just going to put an append on there, right, just in case. So. I've got my append right there. You're not going to see anything. It's just going to script them out to a file. And boom, it's done. What do you think it would happen if I wanted to script only tables from a certain schema or with a specific owner or of a certain row count? That would be stupid, but whatever, right? Anything that has a property, you can do. Or with a certain data space used or whatever, right? I mean, whatever properties you can think of, for a table to use only ones that have indexes, only ones that don't have indexes, right? Really cool stuff that you can do here, and it's all just the same little one line. It's just a little where clause that you put in the middle of there, and you can script them any which way you want. Now the thing is, um, let's go up a level. So I'm back at AdventureWorks directory. Okay, so I was at tables. Let's go to stored procedures right here. I can get a directory there. Let's go ahead and say format table because we know that's going to. There we go. So we got a few SPs here, right? Look how hard it's going to be to script these guys. Same command. You heard me hitting the up, right? I wasn't, I'm not typing anything, but it's the exact same command, right? Now, 
I personally, in my environment, I manage in the neighborhood of 700 something servers and I manage them all with PowerShell. One of the big things I have been able to bring into my shop is cycling through all of my boxes every day, every other day, whatever, whatever level you decide to do it at, right? And scripting all of the objects to text files so that if somebody goes, oops, I accidentally dropped this SP or we made changes to this SP yesterday and it's messing things up and we don't have a copy of what it was before. Oops, <laughs> right? My bad. Well, go out to the drive and find the copy you want. I usually save them by date and then pull back the copy you want and then just, and then just put it back into prod. Big deal. I have saved so many developers with something that simple. And really, all I'm doing to, to call the method, it's the same method here, right? It's the exact same method. Same thing with jobs. I can script out all my jobs like this, right? The only thing I have to do is manage the tree and the script. So I go to SPs and then I CD to tables and then I CD to, to um, uh, indexes for a table or then I CD to triggers and then I CD to logins and then I CD to uh, plan guides and so on and so on. And I, just, and I just crawl through my database and just call the exact same script method for every single one of them in my script, everything that I want to capture and I'm golden, right? Let's look at the different information you can get, because I've been blogging on this lately, so it's fresh on my mind, right? Let's look at the different information we can get even at the server level. Now, okay, I do want to explain one more thing to you. This is what we call PowerShell proper. I'm going to stand up because this chair is starting to kill me. Mm. <coughs> this is what we call PowerShell proper, all right? This is what you're going to get if you download PowerShell from Microsoft <coughs> and you install it on your box. SQL 08 and above come with its own version of PowerShell, right? Um, but it comes with what's called a mini shell, this being the full shell, and the other one is called a mini shell. They're fixing that in the next version where it's going to use the full shell, but right now we're stuck with what's called a mini shell. So remember I said that uh, all of the different uh, vendors are starting to write their own providers and you can install those and all that? You can't install any of those into the mini shell. So and I didn't used to think that was a big deal, but it really is, because now everything I try to do, I can't do in the mini shell. But uh, <clears throat> you get to the mini shell. Oh, I am so glad I don't have SQL open. You get to the mini shell from SQL itself. And it can be easy if you're doing just SQL stuff. Um, and I'll go ahead and show you how this, how this works in here. Um, let's do another clear screen. There we go. So I just need to go up a few levels. So I need to go, there we go, now I'm at the host level, right? And let's see, now I'm here, good, I can go to local host. And I'll kind of do these both at the same time, right? So the thing about the SQL PS and SQL, when you access it, is it's context sensitive. It knows where you are. If I right click on databases and say start PowerShell, it starts me at machine name slash default slash databases, right? If I come down into a specific database and say tables and right click on PowerShell, then it puts me in that tree automatically, okay? So that can be handy, right? So if I want to get to the same place there that I would, if I want to get to the same place here that I'm already at over there, I go to the instance level and I say start PowerShell and I go up a level. Now I'm at, I'm not at the instance level, I'm at the server level. Make sense? So if I want to pull a directory at the server level, all I see is instances, right? But if I want to do a GM on it, oh, I can get all kinds of things at the server level, right? So what can this do for your inventory, right? If you can get, oh, I don't know, the number of processors, the product level. So you can get the version of SQL, uh, the patch level, uh, the number of processors, uh, the name, the net name, the number of log files, and so on and so on and so on, right? Um, so many different things you can get at this, at this level, and you can change a lot of them too, but we've got some methods available to us as well, probably. And I know I'm really, here, let me make this a little bit smaller if I can do it without closing this. There we go. So I'm sure we've got some methods available to us. There we go, there's a few methods, right? 
Uh, one of the things that's really cool is enumerate processes. So the DBAs in here, you know the sys processes table, right? Where you see all the processes that are active on the box and you can get the SPID number and what they've run and all that stuff. Enumerate processes right here. If you want to kill all the processes connected to a specific database, it's this much code as opposed to a cursor this long. It's really easy, right? Really, really easy. Um, you can get uh, the back, the, okay, here's a really useful thing that I, that I did just very recently. The default backup directory. It, go, it gets put all over the place depending on who's installing SQL, right? Well, it really matters the default backup directory, right? I mean, because not only does it matter for uh, backups that somebody may put in without a file name, right? But also if they just, but also, it, it, it's a space management thing and it's a, and it's a disk size management thing and all that, right? So it really matters where the default backup directory is and the default file directory. So the default data and log file directories are very important as well because if you've got people on there just saying create database my DB, enter, it's going to use the default directories and you don't want that to go somewhere you don't want it to go, right? So if you want to have a standardized uh, directory set, right, regardless of who installs, not only should, not only should you be scripting your your installs, you should be using the answer file, right? That's number one. But if, assuming you're not doing that, then you can use this even down to the SQL 2000 level. That's what's so cool is these are just SMO calls, right? So you, this isn't just uh, SQL 08 or SQL 05. I'm, I'm managing my entire environment all the way down to SQL 2000 with this, okay? Then you can connect to all your boxes and you can change all of these default paths in one pass. And you know now that your entire environment is standardized. The same thing with um, like file growth rates. How many of us have to manage file growth rates, right? All over the board. Why? Because model in its infinite wisdom, she knows, I can tell, um, gives us a 10% file growth rate for the log and a one meg file growth rate for the data file. Are you serious? One meg, right? Who wants to grow their database one meg at a time? That's like half a transaction, right? So. What I did was I used PowerShell across my hundreds of boxes, wrote a very simple script to go out and change all of my growth rates to a standardized size. And now everything's, because I had everything, because I pulled first, right? I pulled everything and pulled it into a table and across all my servers I had everything for, for log file, I had everything from the default 10% to 170,000 something percent. Think about that, 170,000%, are you serious? There's a bug. At a certain level of 2005 and, and below, that the, file gro the log growth rate can get changed, or the file growth rate can get changed to some astronomical hundreds of percent. Uh, and even if you change it, it can go back in there and change it back for you. So I've actually got that running on those 2005 and below boxes every week to make sure that they stay the same, uh, that, that they all stay at a gig because I've had a couple of them change back on me. So uh, it's, you know, it, it's really amazing the things that you can do here just with a click of a button, right? Um, and like I said, doing things against multiple boxes, who cares? I mean, it's just a couple more lines of code. And I've got all those videos on how to do a lot of this stuff up on Midnight DBA. So this is just a beginning course, right? So I'm not going to get into all of that. But so many things that you can do that are just really, really simple. So if I wanted to do some of that here, where am I? So I'd say uh, for this one, I would say directory, uh, uh, format table, processors, and oh, what's another one? Uh, give me something good, guys. Um, I don't know, I'm just messing around. There we go. So I can see I'm on the RTM version of 08 and uh, I've got two CPUs on the box. But collecting CPUs, that can be very useful, especially across your entire environment where nobody's done any kind of discovery whatsoever, right? Um, and uh, so, da -da 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 -da. let's see if there's anything official I'm missing. Um, 
OK, so back to variables for a minute. Um, does anybody want variables, or do you want another joke? I'll let you. <laughs> do the joke? OK, let's see. Um, OK, how is PowerShell better than your wife? You can put multiple objects into its pipeline. Uh -huh. Uh, you know, I gotta go do one. I gotta go do one for men now, huh? Um, oh yeah, how is PowerShell better than your husband? When PowerShell does something wrong, it admits it. Okay, one more. Um, uh, PowerShell is better than your wife because if PowerShell doesn't like what you put in its pipeline, you can make it silently continue. And, ah, yes. And PowerShell is better than your husband because PowerShell will never ask you to bring one of your friends to help you code. I'll let you all stew on that one for a minute. Okay. So, I got a quick question. The, that four each that you did, mm -hmm. why couldn't you have just done the same, didn't you do the same thing earlier when you just piped and then did the dollar underscore where you were calling stop? kind of confused on why you needed the 4-H on that. Okay. Um, yeah, so because you're pulling back a list of things. The question was, why do you need the 4-H, right? Mm -hmm. So do you, do you have the specific example? That well, it was the what one you did. Get service pipeline, and then you did the... Okay. Okay. So what? We don't need to do stop. It was just that the dollar sign underscore, I thought that was the, the iteration. Right, it is. So but why would you need the for each outside of that? Right, because without the for each, let's go ahead and put it up here, right? Mm -hmm. Curly's. And we'll say we'll say step again because <laughs> my pinky has memory, right? Has muscle memory. <coughs> the for each uh, the the current iteration right here means the current iteration of the loop. Without the for each, there is no loop to have a current iteration of. Right? Yeah. You, you code in a, in a specific language, don't you? you like, like VB or C, Java? Okay, do you all have something that has a for each type of construct in Java? Yeah. You have, is it actually called for each? It is now. Okay, so can you, can you cycle through objects that you haven't put in that for each? Okay, well, I guess I was looking back at your example when you did the where object. Right, so, so the where object is a type of loop as well. It loops, okay. through, it loops through each one of them. It reads each one of them as they come by okay. and compares it to your, to your where criteria. So it, in That's that... That's basically got the four each in it. Yeah, yeah, from a conceptual level, right? Okay. Um, any, of the, any of the PowerShell MVPs listen to that? It's not a four each! I know that. Conceptually think of it like that, right? Okay. But it just it goes through each one of those. Each one of those passes through there, and only the ones that uh, that meet that criteria get filtered out, right? So only the ones that have SQL in them make it to the other side, right? So, but yeah, that's anybody else? Okay, good. I'm sorry. Not like that. Okay, you can. But not in the, the question is, can you query tables? Yes, but not from the, not from the table node, right? Um, and you really wouldn't want to anyway. While we're here, as long as you're asking, okay, let me see if that's in the second class real quick because I don't want to step on my own toes. Dun, 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 dun. This isn't it. I may have put that up. Okay, well, I'll show you real quick. How's that? Um, okay, let's say that I did want to query some tables. Um, SQL itself does have some uh, does have some commandlets itself, right? And one of them is. Does everybody know what the SQL command object is? The SQL command program. It's the command line that you know replaces O SQL and I SQL, right? SQL command. Well, you can actually do stuff with SQL command, right? You can actually run queries and all that, right? So they've got a a command that called invoke SQL command, right? That it's very PowerShellized, right? But you can do the same thing with it. So you can say invoke SQL command, 
right? And then you just pass it server name and database name, right? So dash database o uh, database works query, and here's where you're getting into your query now, right? Uh, does anybody know of any of the? Is it person dot address? Let's say person dot address. Let's do that one. So start from. That should do something. There we go. Right? Kind of crappy. Oh, that was a format table. Right? Wow, there's a lot of stuff in there. Oh, I think that's one of the ones I uh, altered for something else. Um, set it to a variable. Maybe I should have put a where clause on that. There we go. A. Put a GM on it. Woohoo. And let's see, do I have anything here interesting? Nope. So I can say a colon format table. Uh, anybody remember what those columns were? Oh, okay, hold on, hold on. Let me do this instead. Let me do that right. Why do I keep doing that? There we go. Okay, so now that I don't have that formatted as a table object, right? You can see what I did here. I just did invoke SQL command, passed it a query, and then just set it to A, right? So now the properties become the column values, right? So now I can say pipe A to a format table, and I can pull back uh, city address ID. Oh, okay. And it'll take a sec. There we go. And now I can get all that. Now I can just work with those as I want to, right? I'll stop that. Control C to stop that, by the way. So, you guys see how that works? Very simple, right? We can just set that equal to that. Now, the cool thing is, and this is, this is where <clears throat> I'm telling you that how easy it is to be able to do things against multiple boxes. I personally have all of my servers in a table. So I set A equal to the result set from the boxes I want to change. And then I just pipe A to the for each. And for each one of those, I make the scripting change that I want to do or whatever. That's what I mean. How easy is that, right? You don't have to do it that way. I can say. Well, there's got to be some authorization stuff with that too, right? Yeah, anything you have rights to do. Yeah, you can do anything you have rights to do. Right now, um, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, let's let's talk about one sec. Remind me in a second, okay? Um, so PowerShell knows how to automatically deal with array. So any common delimited list you give it is automatically going to be an array. So I can say localhost comma So if you only want to do it against say three boxes. Oh, cuz I didn't put an equal in there. There we go. If I type a then I get my list of servers, right? Now all I got to do is say a pipe for each, don't forget your curlies, for each one of those do something, right? So that's how easy it is to do something against two boxes or 2,000 boxes. It's just whatever's in your array. It doesn't matter, right? The code doesn't change. Once I fill array, the rest of the code doesn't care how I populated a, right? Whether I did it from an Excel or from a text file or from uh, a query. How would you get it from a text file? Ah, I love this. We, we've learned how to write to a text file, right? Out dash file. Well, to get, I think I may even have something here on a text file. Let me see. 
if I can, if I do, then it is, okay, servers.txt. So localhost, server1, server2, right? I'll save that. So to read from a file, and we've all tried to read from a file in, uh, in VB script, right? Total BS. Such a pain, right? Such a pain. Just use get content. So if you have a file that has the servers in it that you want, just use get content and set it to a variable and go. Or you can just say get content and pipe that to your for each loop. But I like to work with variables like that because that way I can fill the variable. In. If, I, if I decide to change the way that I fill the variable, I don't have to change anything else in the script because I'm, I'm working with A from then on out. And then whatever I had to do to fill A is fine, right? Only now, so, this, so if I were to say get content and then pipe that to the for each loop, it would work the same way, right? Just print that. Yeah, I did something wrong, but you get the idea. Um, but A, no matter how I fill A, whether it be from the, the invoke SQL command or from a, get, from a get content or from a get service or a get WMI call, whatever, the rest of the script doesn't have to be changed. So each of the items listed in the text file, are they actually database references or are they strings? Oh, ah. Uh, un until so I can... Right. Until I connect to it, they're just strings. But once I connect to them, then they're database objects. So inside of here... Get content A. Okay, so all I did was print them, right? But once I do this, now I have to actually make a connection. So I would say... I would say CD SQL Server colon SQL backslash uh, dollar sign underscore backslash default or backslash name, right? And so I would connect to that box and just put that that current iteration in there as the box I want to connect to, and then I would do what I wanted to do to that box. Then I would connect in the next box and do it. Connect in the next box and do it. Does that make sense? So it looks something like. Uh, da -da 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 right so that's how I would connect to each one of those boxes and then I would once I make that connection then I would do something or slash if I had a single database across you know dev and QA and test and I wanted to make sure that um, the tables on dev were the same as the other two I would script out all the ones on dev then I connect to these drop all the tables and then read and then install them and then drop all the tables on test and then do them there and just make sure that they're all the exact same, right? So something like that is a, and, and I would do that by connecting to every single one of the databases. Now, <clears throat> okay, so I'm, I'm starting to step on stuff. So I'm getting into more string stuff in the next session, okay? We got some really cool string stuff coming. But um, that's how I would do that against multiple databases, or against multiple servers, against multiple anything, right? Because I could connect to the same server and do the same thing against multiple databases, right? So I'm on this server, so I'll say cd uh, default, right? Databases, right? So I've got all these databases. Let's say I wanted to do something to every single database. Well, it would be the same thing, right? I would say a pipe that and then inside of there, well, you that's a percent. So inside of there, I would do whatever I wanted to do to every single one of the databases, right? Or if I were in a database and I wanted to do something to all the tables, or I were in a database and I wanted to do something to all the users or all the schemas or something like that, right? That's quite often the kind of stuff I do. I connect to all the schemas and add uh, and give somebody permissions to all the schemas or to only certain schemas, or I'll give certain users permissions to a couple different schemas or something, something, right? So that's the kind of stuff you quite often do that's a lot easier to do here than it is in T-SQL. Now, T-SQL has its place, right? It really does. 
Um, there are some things that are still easier to do in T-SQL than it is in PowerShell. But once you want to do it to more than one object, boom, right? It's a lot easier to create a login in T-SQL than it is in PowerShell. I had this assignment two months ago where they were starting up a brand new application and they had 70 something users that they wanted to add as users to the, the give logins and give permissions to this database and they gave them to me in an Excel sheet. I was like, really? I thought you were going to make this hard. <laughs> 15 minutes. Bam. All the users, all the logins, all the users had permissions to the database and everything and it was done. They gave me their, they gave me their login IDs and all I had to do was just build the string and just across this database and I did 70 users in the amount of time that I could have done one. So. Yeah. It depends on how they give it to you. Well, okay? So. Right, right, right. Well, yeah. So, like I said, it depends on how they give it to you. Um, the way I did it, okay, was I gave myself an extra step. This was, the, this was part of the 15 minutes, right? They gave it to me in an Excel spreadsheet. I saved it as a, as a CSV. And now I've, just, now I've just got the columns. And, it's got, and, and PowerShell has built-in stuff for working with CSV. So... I was golden. Uh, another way that I would do this, um, because you can call PowerShell and do it just like you said, but then you have to, I mean, you can call Excel and work with the, the worksheet itself, but then you have to get into the actual, uh, uh, then you have to get into the actual .NET classes. The same way that you would do that in .NET is the way you would do it here. And it's easy once you get it, but again, it's like that much code to get into the Excel sheet. Once I get it into my variable, Oh, I'm golden, right? But if I'm going to do that, I'll import the Excel into SQL and then read it from a table and I'm right back to where I want to be, right? For something like that, oh, yeah, I'll put a, a table in with, with 70 rows in it, right? It takes me five minutes to put it into a table, and then I access that table the way I access everything else, and then I'm golden, right? Or I'll just take the ones I want and just put them into a, into a, a, a plain text file, and just do it after that, or put it into a CSV, or you know, convert it to XML, which is harder. Um, but you could, but you could do it, right? But yeah, you could do the straight XML call, but I didn't. And there's stuff out there like the PCSX extensions on uh, CodePlex give you dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of commandlets for working with things, and I'm pretty sure there's some Excel stuff in there that would make it a lot easier. They they obscure all of that stuff, right? So you would just Right. Yeah, you would probably have to call the, the, the Excel sheet itself, and however you do that in .NET is how you would do that here, and just fill the variable with it, and then, yeah. Uh, if you hook up with me afterwards, I'll, I'm sure I've got an example of it. Because it, it can't be rocket surgery. .NET programmers do it. That was my last dig. Okay, guys. Am I in the same room afterwards? Oh, cool, so I don't have to move. And this recording will be up on Midnight DBA on the events page.